Look into my eyes, brown, my dark hair, my skin. Because of this, me dicen mexicana. Listen to me speak. My English is fluent. My Spanish I must learn. My complexion is fair. Because of this, me dicen huera. Who am I? ¿Cuál es mi cultura? I am an island. The Mexican has stood on my land. The white man has stood on my land. Because of this, I am bicultural. Mis padres nacieron en Texas. Mi abuelo ha nacido en México. Because of this, soy Chicana. Much of the history of Hispanic and Latino peoples in the state is reflected in the story of the West Side neighborhood of St. Paul. The complexion of the West Side, meaning the river flats just south of downtown St. Paul, traditionally mirrored the most recent wave of immigrants. Early in the century, it was Eastern European Jews. Mexican Americans began to put down roots in the neighborhood after they were recruited to work here as laborers in the sugar beet and railroad industries. As early as the 1930s, St. Paul's West Side Settlement had become the largest Mexican community in the state. And the community institutions that grew up here reflected that. As the neighborhood became established, it served as a comfortable destination for newer groups of immigrants from Caribbean and Latin American countries. Clotilde Lopez was part of one of those then newer groups, the Puerto Ricans, when she arrived in the 1950s. Now in her 80s, she has been able to retain her native language and many of her traditional values through a life tending family and neighborhood. Family has defined and directed Clotilde's life. Widowed at a young age with eight living children, she was leading a life of great difficulty in Puerto Rico. She was brought here to be with her children after her sons moved to Minnesota to work. Though living conditions were not always the best on the west side for recent arrivals, the difficulties were eased by a community of people with similar beliefs and language. Community organizations like Our Lady of Guadalupe Church and the Neighborhood House helped in the transition to North American life. Clotilde's sons worked in the stockyards nearby, and as they became settled in their homes, she lived with them and cared for their children, helping their families by taking in sewing for the neighbors. When we first arrived here, I used to mend slacks and they paid me whatever they felt. I never asked any set price. They would pay me two or three dollars and I mended slacks and I sewed shirts for everyone. So we always got help from someone. That is how we got by. While Clotilde comes from a time and place where the joining and maintaining of family were the texture of life, she has seen an unraveling that challenges those values. It's very different. It's very... Well, even in the same time, the family of today. Now things are very different. The family has changed a lot. It is so different from what it used to be. I thank God that I was able to raise my kids, and I could scold them and punish them if I have to. Today, the children don't mind anyone because their parents do not teach them from an early age. You do not do this, you do not do that. I raised all my grandchildren since they were very young. I have always been with some of my grandchildren. It was not rare to see 10 or 12 children at my house, all my grandchildren. 
Though she has moved into her own apartment, her family remains an essential part of her life. The strength of those family bonds reflects her connection to the larger community as well. Sometimes people in the West Side do not get along, but not with me. Everyone living here is like family to me. When I go to church there, I meet all the other seniors, and they ask me how I am doing. In church, there are 15 or 20 women, and we greet one another very happily. Here, it is very easy to go to church. All I have to do is cross the street. Mass is in Spanish? There is one. Is that the one you go to? No, I always go to the service in English. But the reason is that I have the Mass book for years, and I know it by heart. The father will read in English, and I read it in Spanish. Do you think it was necessary for you to learn English? Ah, if I knew English, I could be very happy, but not at my age. What is the use? I should have learned it before. I could have learned English, but I was always busy taking care of children. I was not selfish, and I gave everything to my kids. If it was not for them, I could have learned English. All of them have learned to speak English here. Times are changing on the West Side. In the 1960s, after perennial problems with flooding, the West Side flats were cleared for industrial development, and residences were relocated up the hill. Hispanic cultural events are still centered on the West Side, but gradually the area is becoming home to groups of newer immigrants, as many Hispanic and Latino residents are settling throughout the Twin Cities. Many Hispanic residents of the Twin Cities, like Clotilde Lopez, have remained connected to the West Side, but the nature of the connection varies. The Martinez Corporation, headquartered on the River Flats, was founded here by Tony Martinez. But where Clotilde was part of a place where she crosses the street to church, Tony's neighborhood spans the world. His equipment can know any terrain that exists and translate the hills and shorelines to human understanding. His business? Maps. Martinez has mapped just about everything from local golf courses to high-tech government research facilities. The project we're currently working on right now that has been the best project we've ever had is uh, the Superconducting Super Collider project in, uh, in Texas. Our responsibility was for the aerial photography acquisition the surveying, the, the getting all the field uh, ground control that we have to have to control the photography, and the uh, mapping of the entire ring. Tony's route to success was charted by untypical circumstance. Born in St. Paul, he was raised by his godparents. Like many Mexican-Americans living in Minnesota at the time, his adopted family were laborers. Working with them, he first encountered the indignities of their place in the wider world. I know one family there uh, in the southern part of the state, they, they, uh, we came to live with them and uh, we reported to work and the, and the first thing they did was uh, they had the young, uh, the farmer's son hook a chain to, uh, from, uh, to his tractor, went over to the corner of the property, hooked it onto a chicken coop dragged it out to the edge of the field, two of them. And um, that was our living quarters. 
As Tony grew into his teens, his family expected him to quit school and work to contribute to the family income, but he knew he wanted more. The part that really I remember when, when I was young, that when we were working in one of the dumps picking up uh, scrap metal, and we went into a restaurant to eat, and we were dirty. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a fancy restaurant, just a little truck stop. But everybody looked at you, you know, and, and I remember telling myself at that time that I'm not going to get dirty in the kind of work that I do when I get old. While he didn't finish high school, he eventually entered the service in 1950. It was during that three-year stint with the Army he received what may have been his most valuable education. Stationed in Japan during the Korean War, Martinez learned the art of map making. After leaving the service, he worked for the highway department and then a mapping company before beginning his own mapping business 18 years ago. Are those fish nets? <laughs> I hope so. They are now. <laughs> they are now, yeah. While his business currently generates about a million dollars in revenue every year, at the start he probably saw more of the region than even his map making eyes could bear. The first few years it was. Uh, a lot of cold calls, traveling in my 71 Pinto and all over the state of Minnesota, all over the Twin Cities and North Dakota and to Wisconsin, Iowa, visiting people and without appointments, just walk in cold. Here's my card, here's what I do, and um, give us a try. And uh, we, uh, it took some time. Do you think the fact that you were a minority was a, 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 an issue here? Not in all cases. I, I don't recall too many situations where I was mistreated or um, given any kind of indication that, that uh, it was an issue. I, I believe that, that having um, the amount of experience that I have and knowledge of the product uh, passed they, they passed that barrier. After the initial difficulties, Martinez made a conscious decision to direct his efforts to jobs that required minority participation. The Minority Procurement Program, set up to encourage minority involvement in government contracts, allowed his business to survive. I think that I'm a prime example of why it is necessary to be able to participate in national contracts and be able to perform is an opportunity that you wouldn't have if there wasn't a minority program. The system works. Uh, it, it works if you can perform. There is a, a good old boys network, but the thing is that the good old boys quickly realize that, that they need you. For example, um, I once got a call from an engineer in Chicago, and he said, Mr. Martinez, is, uh, do you do mapping for aerial photography? I said, yes, I do. He says, do you uh, do digital mapping? Can you use, uh, deliver a product in intergraph format? I said, yes, we can. Are you uh, certified as a minority business in the state of Illinois? I said, yes, we are. Are you pre-qualified in surveying and mapping in the state of Illinois? I said, yes, we are. There was a big pause. Then finally he came back and said, where the hell you been? Don't you know we need you out here? Tony Martinez has found a home in the places the business world has taken him. In my experiences of marketing and client contact and getting the business started, dealing with Mexico, dealing with Mexican engineers, uh, dealing with a super collider, dealing with the federal government, all these different types of uh, business meetings that we have, every now and then a little bell will ring in my head in the middle of that meeting, I'll say, this is where I want to be. This is where I've always wanted to be. Twenty years ago, unable to rebuild on their lot on St. Paul's west side, he and his wife Lupe moved to the suburb of Burnsville. In this spacious middle-class environment, they raised their ten children. See? <laughs> well, we don't want the kids to understand us. Oh, isn't that terrible? Their children are grown, but in what is somewhat of a tradition among Mexican-American families, they help with the care of their youngest daughter's son. The Martinez live what they call a suburban lifestyle, 
holding on to some traditions while living in a mainstream world. The mainstream you're trying to join is America, and what is America but a mixture of all types of societies and cultures. It's not difficult to, to fit in and yet to maintain your own culture. Uh, we didn't, I didn't see any great difficulty in, in, uh, in my social and business life to, to uh, assimilate and, and blend. You can blend, but you can still uh, isolate that part of your culture when you want to. And that's an opportunity that uh, a lot of people don't have. We participate in, in um, the local Cinco de Mayo and, and the local fiestas and, and all this. And then we go back to our home in Burnsville and, and go back to doing our thing of being a suburban family. That's what this country is about. It's, it's a, just a mixture of people.